This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to another afternoon sunset safari with us here in Drum in the Cyber Sands. My, St my name is Steve Folgenbridge. I'm joined on camera by Sebastian, and the drone team is in the other vehicle for a change. We're in Wendy, and please send through your questions and comments. Hashtag Safari Live or follow us on the YouTube stream. Let us know what you'd like to see, talk about. We are seeing if we can follow up on the little chief, Hosanna, that amazing young leopard. Uh, where he might have been this morning. We've just checked the last place Tristan left him and he's not there. So where do you think he might be? Hmm. I've got a feeling he might have just turned back again and gone back to his favorite hole. What do you think? It is a very nice 29 degrees Celsius, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. It's blustery. It's a good weather for leopard to be catching something. Uh, it hasn't been cold today. Well, it hasn't been hot, should I say. So it's a good chance he, he's moved and has been moving. And well, we're going to go have one little look at Voyetella um, watching hole because he might be there. Obviously, we've got to check the tracks along the way. That's the one thing that we have advantage over these animals with is they can try and sneak and hide. But uh, if we get our nose to the ground, well, we quite often can find them. How amazing was that safari this morning? With James doing his thing at Twitter Watching Hall, two crocodiles killing two in parlor in less than a week. Unbelievable. But I'm not the only one out this afternoon. Sydney is also on drive and he'd like to say good afternoon. A very, very good afternoon to you all and welcome to the beginning of the afternoon game drive. I am Sydney and I am not traveling alone this afternoon. I am with Senzo, my camera operator. We are both going to be with you. This follow us on Twitter hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube chat stream. My plan this afternoon is quite very easy because the weather is nice and overcast which is good for the animals. I will be looking for Tandy and Talamba. I haven't seen them for quite a long time. Uh, what I saw this morning was a lovely sighting by Chitwa Dam. So I will be hanging around central part of the game reserve and see if I can find those two cats. Not windy at all. It's nice and cool. The chances of trekking today is perfect. I haven't yet spotted any of the animals. Just want to try and see if I can find some tracks here. As I can see, there has been some activities happening. I am not alone in the reserve this afternoon. Steve is also doing some other trekking on the other side of the game reserve. Let's see. Yeah, well, nothing at the moment. We are still having a look. Nothing seems to have passed by this way. So we're just going to go have a quick look at that Voyatella watching hole, see if he is around. And if not, we're going to spend a little bit more time in the area where the tracks were or where he was last seen. There's a good chance he's either gone to one of the watching holes or he's moved off just slightly from where he was. But who knows? Here are some lovely impala. Maybe they will tell us where he is. There is a beautiful one on top of the... Ooh. The second rut is happening and these two males on the right-hand side... Are you right there, Seb? Yeah. These two males on the right-hand side are... Oh scaring all the ladies. That's what happens when there's pheromones in the air. 
the males get all excited again for mating rights to the odd handful of females that potentially didn't get mated with. Here comes a third one into the fray from the side. You can hear that very funny noise that the impala make. Such beautiful but yet strange animals in their own right. Good indicators of, of predators around. And we have actually got a couple other animals with them over there. Let's go up to them, shall we? There's a zebra, at least one zebra, and one wildebeest. It seems to be a bit of a, an accumulation here of animals sort of hanging together, trying to shelter out of this wind. The Juma migration is in full swing at the moment. I'm just going to make some space here because those impala seemingly still want to have a little bit of a go at each other. There's a beautiful zebra. You can just see the size difference of a fully grown male impala. Zebras are far bigger. Enjoying the company of these others. Because the Unkohumas were through two days ago or the night before. It's very hard for me to remember exactly when because we seem to be in a bit of a bubble with all these rehearsals and early mornings but Unkohumas had a zebra kill not far from here and um, no doubt it would be a part of the family of the zebra here because I only see two zebras so maybe it was part of their family it's hard to say but if it was then the memory would still be quite quite real for them my safari you reckon Hassan is missing an opportunity well he would really struggle to catch one of these when they're in such a large group it really is difficult with so many eyes and ears and that is the purpose of these accumulations is to spot the predator gives you all more time to feed and to get fat and healthy because they were all fear lions if they come through invariably they also 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 shout it any leopard that might move through so it does pay a lot of sort of benefits to them all to hang out like this and just sheltering from the wind in the thickets there that's where we're going to find our animals today hiding away in the thickets Kermi Hosanna had a meal I'm trying to think I haven't been with him for this last week I think he had a another Daker. I think that was on um, last week that we know of that he uh, had up the tree just behind Gallego Lodge that Tingana came and stole from him. I'm trying to remember the date, but um, then we don't know what scrub hares and small birds he's had, and also we missed him for a few days. He didn't come out of the block here, but I'm sure he had something, and we didn't find him on it. It's very hard to say, but they can go two weeks or so, three weeks without eating. Well, they don't choose to. This is a time of year for, of plenty for them. Um, the accumulation of animals to the watering holes, as we've seen, Hosanna spent a lot of time around Vuatella watering hole, and he's been catching dakers by the dozen, it seems. And yet there's still so many dakers. I find it incredible. Their breeding must be really, really awesome because they're just constantly around. Even from the drone, we get caught up with lots of dakers. We spot a lot of them ideal habitat in and around a Juma area for them and hence why we have such a high density of leopards. Okay well we're going to move off from our little family unit of animals here and in the meantime let's go over to Sydney and see how his tracking's getting along. I am now on Nyala Road in the middle of the game reserve trying to see if I can find some very nice fresh tracks of these cats as here it is the last area they have been spotted some few days ago. So 
So Tandi is with Kalamba in this area, uh, Kalamba the little one. So when there are two like that, chances of them to come out is very high. Because yesterday I haven't seen them and nobody saw them yesterday, which means they are somewhere, they must have to come out for a drink or maybe for some other hunting activities, who knows. Rosalind, the leopards, they can fight very hard and their fight sometimes is, is so very much painful seeing because they can screech, scratch each other and they, some, sometimes it results uh, one of them uh, bleeding a lot on the face as they can be able to use those claws to scratch each other as they are fighting. So I have seen a leopard fight, just that it was at night, it was not a good sighting, but yes, I also hear some other people who witnessed those kind of fights that they can be vicious sometimes. Haley, at the moment the game reserve it is very much dry, but this is the right season for the vegetation to look like this. It's normal because now we are just at the end of our dry season. Anytime soon we are going to get some first rains and everything will get back to normal. We do have some of the uh, evergreen trees here, I can see, which are still green to maintain some of the animals. Grazers is the ones that are at this stage feeding a lot on the dry grass, but they, they're going to have to balance that with quite a lot of water consumption. They must eat dry grass and they must go and then uh, drink a lot of water. So when going to drink, that is when our predators such as Osana will be waiting for them to come. Oh, I've got a very beautiful bird. Can you see that bird? The uh, sense right on top of the tree, there's a, a bird that looks like it's a battalion. Look at that, that is quite a very beautiful bed. Yesterday, I have just seen a juvenile battalion next to one of the nests in the game reserve. And today, look at that one. I have got now the adults, nice and very big. You can see there's some wind blowing there. These beds, they are very good indicators of the carcasses in the reserve. Look at the color of the big, nice and uh, pinkish. But the juveniles don't look like adults. They look completely different, as if they are two different species. So they also like to scavenge the uh, battalions. It is here in Juma Game Reserve where I have seen my first battalion. In Waterberg, which is one of the areas not very far away from Johannesburg. The battalions, we don't have them that side. So I was very lucky and these are very beautiful birds. So I'm just gonna carry on now and see if we can uh, find some of the trucks. So we'll, I will just now carry on and see uh, if we can pick up any of the tracks as I still have got a huge responsibility of finding Tingana and Kalamba. Not going to give us any time to do tracking if we're going to be jumping like this. Hello. Well, we are back at the watering hole. We're going to see if we can find any tracks here see tracks of a male leopard. A herd of elephants have been through here. Let's go and have a look, shall we? Nothing as yet. 
but we know he likes to hide in these bushes just over here. Okay, there's a track there. There's one track. It could have been from yesterday though. Very hard to tell. There's lots of animals on top of it. These bushes here he likes a lot. It's been quite incredible that he's been around this watering hole for as long as he has. I find that quite incredible. The power of water. Indeed. Hello Safari Sally, you want to know my best advice on people learning to track? Just be patient with yourself and um, try and think out of the box. You um, obviously need to learn the tracks first. Learning the tracks is the first thing. And then being able to trail an animal, well that's a different story altogether. Once you can identify, so you get two elements of, of tracking. You get what we call track and sign, which is um, looking at a track on the ground and identifying the species and maybe the movement, even the sex. And then you get trailing, which is the ability to, to go on the tracks of an animal and follow them and then find them. That takes a lot of practice, a lot of time. It takes years to be to get good at that. People like Herbie have been doing it for 25 years or so. I've been doing it for about 10 years and you know, we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. Um, but once you learn the area and you know where things are, that you kind of overlay onto your, your map inside your head about where the animal could be moving. Seb, should we do a little scan with that thermal in some of the grass, eh? Should go up here a little touch. Okay, well, it seems like the Marium seems to have sorted out some of their technical issues and Taylor McCurdy is going to be joining us this afternoon. We're going to be going all the way up to the Marium with the giraffe. We have a giraffe. Hello, everybody. Better late than never. There is a giraffe. There are many giraffes. There are plenty of giraffes in the Marium, but I think I've told you this a number of times and I think you've all seen it for yourselves. Isn't that quite cool? But I suppose I better introduce myself at some point as well, seeing as though we have just started the show. It is, I'm glad that the wind has died down. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me today is Archie. Woohoo! And this is a live and interactive safari, and it's great to, of course, have you all here. So remember to send through those wonderful questions. But um, like I said, we've got lots and lots of giraffe. They seem to like it around here. Every single day, without doubt, on the main river road, here in the Mara Triangle, you can find not one giraffe, but sometimes like 30 or 40 giraffes, and that's a small group. There are quite a few of them. I'm hoping that we're going to see giraffe crossing the river at some point, maybe some of the shallow spots, but mm, maybe not right now. Although they are enjoying eating on the tree line. Look, there's another one. They're just coming out from everywhere. Perhaps, perhaps the giraffe grow out of trees. No, they don't. I'm just talking absolute nonsense. But this is very, very cool. Such a, a nice scene to see. Of course, our chair in the Mara. You can hear lots and lots of cars driving past us. That's also very normal. Oh, giraffe girl, I suppose you do like giraffe. Hey, with a name like that, you say thank you for making my heart smile. It's a pleasure. I don't know how, how are you supposed to do it. I don't know, how do those people do that and they take the perfect photo that's silhouetted? My fingers always get in the way. Anyways, um, very, very awesome. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to do. What I do want to tell you is that, uh, yes, Louise, I'm a specialist at being awkward. We should all know this by now, but I don't care. I'll just embrace it. Um, well, what my original plan was, was to sit and wait very patiently at Main North Crossing because there was a leopard that had killed a wildebeest at some point. We're not really sure when. And uh, we were really hoping to, of course, have a look at that leopard. But unfortunately, the... Uh, Sorry guys, I'm live. Everyone's of course wants to sit right next to us and then idle their engine. It's my favorite thing in the entire world. Sorry, I was just waving and then reminding them that we do do a live safari show as well and that I can't stop and talk to everybody all the time. <laughs> it's one of the hardest things to do. Anyways, so there was a leopard that was eating wildebeest at Main Crossing. And we Archie for how long? Like 45 minutes. 
waiting patiently, hoping that this wildebeest was not going to come alive because it would be scary. But that the leopard would come back and then I could hear like a little cysticula or a warbler or something, a small bird alarming. So I know that that leopard is still in there. I also wouldn't imagine it would just abandon a beautiful kill like that, that it could feast on for quite some time. But then some cars, were, they blocked so we couldn't actually see anything. So we had to leave, unfortunately. But maybe next time, maybe at some point we'll get you a leopard. There are lots around at the moment. So you better keep watching every single day, every morning, every afternoon, because you don't know when they're going to show up. Anyways, we're going to go a bit further down the road. Maybe we're going to see that serval again. Let's go to Sydney, who has got an animal that has a nose shaped like this. I have got the water back now starting to get disappeared. It's quite a very small bachelor head. So the bachelor heads are those kind of heads consisted of the males, both young and adults. Look at that. A nice and a very good looking round ring at the back, which is just a sign for the follow me sign in case of a danger. Also, when they are just feeding very relaxed, they see each other from that long distance. Look, these animals can be so very much camouflaged. You can see now when he's walking in between the trees, even that white line, you don't see it at all. So I'm just gonna pull forward and see if we can have a, a, a good sighting. But I can see now they are trying to move deep into the thick bushes. I am sure they are not very far away from the water holes because that is their special preference. They simply got disappeared. I cannot see them anymore. So they've been feeding together with some of the impalas here in the area. So the combination here is about safety, safety in numbers. You can pick up a very distinctive smell here. So the animals, such as the water bugs, for them to mark their territories, the males, they don't use urine, they don't use droppings. They rely on their strong body scent in order to use as, 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 as a scent mark. He just fell into the artifact hole there. Uh, there be the animals such as the water bugs. If you can check throughout the year, their bodies, they are full of hairs. They are very much hairy with the fluffy hairs from the neck. It's one of those animals which are very much difficult to tell if indeed they are in a very good condition or not. So, but yes, it's true in our area at this stage, the animals, various kind of species, they are still in a very great, great condition. It's quite difficult to tell if the vegetation is dry at the moment. It, they look normal. So now I am just going to go and look much further in the area. But Steve, my other colleague, maybe, I don't know if he got something interesting for you already. Let's see. Nothing yet. We are still checking. Uh, we have nothing around that watering hole. So we're just going to go around the area where um, he, Osana was seen this morning. See if we can get any tracks of where he's possibly moved. But um, when it's windy like this, it can be very difficult to find animals. They like to shelter down in the drainage lines, and it's not very easy to just bumble in there. So without finding tracks, it's going to be quite difficult. Uh, as I suggest, there's a good chance he's moved, but how far exactly is hard to say. But we're going to keep on on our wanderings and see whereabouts we come up. We um, actually found him on the drone close to camp this morning and we helped Tristan guide through this really, really unnavigatable block towards our left hand side and uh, managed to stay with him, which uh, was quite incredible actually. 
important the use of technology hello PD I believe you're a new viewer welcome to the show that's a very good question you want to know why the animals don't attack well, first of all, um, a lot of the animals are afraid of us, so they generally move away. There's sort of a zone that you can get towards them and they move away. That's their comfort zone. Um, and if you get too close, they move away. But if you corner them, cornering an animal is never a good idea. These animals are wild, and if we had to corner one, however it might be, that animal would obviously decide to attack you rather than well to escape. So it's all about space, it's all about not sort of squashing animals into a tight corner and respecting them and understanding their behavior so we do understand the behavior of animals it takes quite a bit of time to to get into that sort of state of mind and a lot of training required as well we don't just have they just send people out driving in the african wilderness without any sort of qualification especially if you have guests and if you read the animals behavior they generally are quite shy and move away from you uh, but eventually over time they get quite used to the vehicles and so you can view them quite safely quite naturally without causing them any harm and if you go too close you're going to cause their behavior to change and that's not ethical it's all about ethics out here and if you understand um, the behavior changes you can preempt you can make decisions so example if I saw an animal and its behavior started to change I just switch off the car take away all the influence that might be causing it any stress if need be even move back but eventually over a period of time the habituation process sets in and the animals realize ah, well these that uh, these things in the box that are moving towards us aren't causing us any harm they're not stealing our food they're not chasing us they're not hurting us in any way they're not competing with us they eventually just ignore us and sometimes you'll see how close elephants come to the car leopards they come really close they don't really see us as a, as a threat anymore so i hope that answers the question um but a lot of the animals also they've become accustomed to seeing the car but if i get out on foot they see the two-legged upright standing human and uh, you will not get as close to them as you do in a vehicle, that's for sure, because they've evolved on the African continent with this hominid, this two-legged hunter that has hunted them for a very, very long time. And uh, some of the vehicle, they don't associate that with us. But we're going to be all the way back up to the Masai Mara. Taylor McCurdy has found you some spectacular birds. Welcome everybody to the Bird Beach Paradise here in the Mara Triangle where everything is very relaxing, cool, calm, collected. Where's the, where's the pool boy? I don't know what type of cocktails birds drink but you know I'm sure they'd like something. Maybe the, they would like a catfish smoothie. No, I don't know. <laughs> I do like this spot, however, because every time I come here, there's lots of birds, and they're doing nothing except I, I lie. I lie. They are. They're. They're grooming themselves at the moment. So maybe this is. I, I shouldn't call it um, the beach. The bird beach bar. Perhaps it should be the salon. You know where you realign those feathers. You know, come and get yourself nice and clean. And you know, it was quite interesting. In and amongst all the birds here, those yellow-billed storks we're looking at. There's one. Is that that same one or was it the next one? Oh, there it is. Look at this one. Now, I don't know if it's just dirty. The closer I look at it, the more dirty it actually looks. Initially, I was like, well, maybe it's a juvenile because it's, even its legs were a different color. But as Archie has zoomed in now, look at that. Filthy. Goodness. You need to go into the washing machine, bird, to get those... Uh, those feathers nice and white again. You're not going to impress anybody. Look at that one. That's what a yellow-billed stork is supposed to look like. Beautiful with a bright red facial skin, the bright red legs, and then of course a lovely long yellow beak. Roxy, you said you love the birds here in the Mara. Yes, I do too. We'll see what we can. We'll probably try and do a bit of birding. I'm sure we'll see some superb starlings. Who would like to see some superb starlings? They're very pretty. I won't show you a picture in the book because I'll wait for them to find some along this road. They normally are. And then of course my favorite of the herons, the black-headed heron. Thank you. Thank you for looking. They're so meticulous with the way that they check every single feather that they can with their beaks. And they've got interesting beak shapes. Look at that one in comparison. If we compare the beaks between, I suppose, the yellow-billed stork and the black-headed heron there, they're, they're very much different, don't you think? 
I mean, the heron's uh, the heron's beak is almost like um, the tip of a spear. Wouldn't you agree? How uh, it's quite sort of broad in the middle, very sharp, and of course they will stab fish with that. And um, I suppose the yellow-billed storks will do something quite similar, but they have an interesting fishing technique where they walk around with their heads in the water. This is one of their techniques. Of course, all these birds have got various techniques, and they leave their, their beak a little bit ajar, and they move around and try and snap fish up like that. Paula, now you've said that the storks' beaks are almost as long as their legs. Perhaps, I I get what you're saying. The, uh, some of them look like they were just resting slightly. They, they do have very, very long beaks. They have long, well, they don't have as long necks as herons, so I suppose that beak length makes up for it and helps for them to feed easier. And you can see that one at the back almost looks like it's got a little bit of pink tinge coming through on its, uh, on its wings. Breeding season must be around. They normally, the males normally go a slighter tinge of pink um, when they get excited for the birds. Have you ever seen yellow-billed stalk chicken wings before there we go <laughs> uh, pink chicken wings paula my favorite bird is not either or any of the ones that we're looking at at the moment we'll see if we can find you one it's a secretary bird out here in the mara you get them in south africa too but they're in, in the sabi sand you don't see them as much oh look there's a gray heron too oh, that's we were talking about that even a bigger beak than the black-headed heron do you know what I saw today, but I can't tell you which one I saw. I'm pretty sure I saw a fluff tail. I need to actually have a look at my bird book and see what types of fluff tails we get here. But they're very special birds. They like to live in marshy areas, sort of like where there's quite a bit of grass around as well. So yeah, so we'll have to see. That would have been that was a new bird for me. I just from its sort of flight and its behaviour in the long grass, it was acting very much like a fluff tail. But I'll have to check. And they're just resting up. They're not nesting or anything. They really are just bathing in the sun. Hello. Our dear friends, the blacksmith lapwings, oh how I've missed you so much. We don't hear them much here. The other birds are a lot louder and seem to steal the show, I suppose. Meow, Ferrari Safari. I wonder where they're going. <laughs> the cloud of dust that they've left behind them is absolutely spectacular. Maybe that's why that yellow-billed stalk was so dirty, perhaps. Anyways, Sydney is trying his absolute best this afternoon to try and find you some leopards. Hopefully, he will. I am still looking for the leopards, the beautiful Tralamba and Tandi in the area here. But uh, it seems to be very much quiet. No much activities took place according to the evidence I'm seeing on the ground. I have not yet picked up the fresh tracks for Tandi and Kalamba this afternoon. So I am also concentrating on some of the warning calls and none of the warning calls has been given so far about the presence of these cats in this area now. Jennifer, there is quite a lot of um, disturbances when it comes to the tracks. One, the wind can easily blow the tracks. But what makes me to confirm that this is a fresh track is the following. If I see that the track is looking fresh, no insects went over the tracks and is still much visible, I can see the fine sand. That is what convinced me to say this is a fresh track. But if the track is, is, is looking very old, it's when you will see insects going over the tracks and apart from the insects, wind will blow it so that it's not clearly visible. So I have got something now very much beautiful in front of me here. The Bachel zebra is right standing here waiting for us to see. So I know a lot of people, they do have kind of a confusion between zebra, bachelor zebra and the mountain zebras. We both have those species occurring here in Southern Africa, in South Africa. It's just that here in Juma Game Reserve, we only got the bachelor zebras. So the bachelor zebras, the difference between them and the Cape mountain zebras is that they have got 
less black stripes surround their bodies and the mountain zebras they have got lot of black stripes surround their bodies and the bachel zebras their stripes are coming halfway they are coming from underneath their bellies and the mountain zebras their stripes are coming halfway down to their bellies the bachel zebras their stripes they have got some yellowish shadows on their stripes and the mountain zebras don't have the yellowish shadows on their stripes and if you look at the legs there the bachel zebras the legs are not completely fully striped whereas the mountain zebras the legs are completely fully striped right there where we are seeing now be, uh, underneath the tail is one of the areas you can tell between the difference between the male and the female when the line underneath the tail is thin is telling you that it's a male zebra when the line underneath the tail is broad is telling you this is a female zebra these animals got a very dangerous kick meaning that you cannot go confirm by lifting up a tail he is now feeding on these grasses dry grasses these animals prefer to feed on tall grasses if you can check there now this area is not like completely grazed the grasses are still very much tall which is one of the reasons why you see the zebras with the wildebeest because the wildebeest prefers shorter grass and zebras prefers tall grass in other words these zebras they go in front cutting the grass shorter for the wildebeest behind to eat it's quite a very beautiful animal look at that the zebra skin if you can check the it does have two colors which is black and white but to me a zebra is a black color with white stripes but a lot of people say it's a white it's a it's, a, it's, it's white with black stripes but I'm seeing it as an animal white with black stripes look at that this is beautiful so in terms of the eyesight zebras they have got a very good good eyesight and both male and females they look pregnant all year round they both have a very big stomach and they are not ruminants they just have a simple stomach like we do so there must be more zebras not very far away from where it is now as zebras So these zebras you can see now there's more feather down there they they walk in groups zebras they walk in harems but harems they also feed together with the other harems when harems are together then it it is called a dazzle of zebras different harems together forms a dazzle So now I will be heading any fresh tracks in the area here so I'm just going to head on now and see and carry on with my trekking well good luck Sydney I hope you managed to find Tandy wherever she might be i haven't had any success yet with hosana there are some tracks but no they're not that fresh but it's hard to say when when it's windy like this the wind also can damage the tracks cutting the edges off moving dust across takes away the freshness it can be quite deceptive Lots of hyena. We just came past the, the site where the Unkuhumas killed that zebra a couple nights ago and the hyena ended up stealing the remains from them, but there was nothing left. I'm just going to go and have a quick look, see if we could identify if it was a male or female, but couldn't find anything. <laughs> they, all, they picked up the pieces. We saw it from the drone. There were hyenas scattered all over the place feeding on that zebra.
I don't even know if it was a big zebra or not. All we know is it was a dead one. <laughs> Hello Michael, no, no luck with the, no luck with the hyena den, uh, it seems to be off the property, wherever it is, but no one can tell us exactly where, we will let you know, I promise, as soon as we find one, you will all know immediately. So we've done an entire loop now. Hello Monique, you want to know about cheetah and hyena tracks? Well they're quite different actually, very very different. Let me show you in my lovely book here. Here is a lovely hyena track. The size is very similar, hyena tracks are very similar but you see the back, these two lobes here, these two lobes and the toes are kidney shaped and you can see the claws. Cheetah tracks you can see the claws as well but um, the difference is this back here but something you don't notice in the track here but in the sand these areas here are all pinched the sand is pinched together let me get the cheetah track now there we go and there is the cheetah track very similar in length but the back pad is is parallel to the front of the toes and it's got three lobes at the back the claws are visible, but there's a lot of space between the toes and the pad, which means you don't get this pinched sort of sand patch in between there. You know, quite a clear print on the ground with what we call negative space. Here it is in the sand over there, and the mud is not a very good, not a very good picture to be honest. But a cheetah track looks similar to a very big leopard track that's sort of been squashed in the vice grip. Just squashed, because if I show you the leopard track. There we go, he's on this page over here. There's a leopard track. There's a big male. So if you go and squash that, oh, a cheetah looks like that, except the claws are clearly visible in cheetah. And these two ridges over here actually stand out in the cheetah track because that is the grip that they use, almost like your track shoes. They're used for, for moving quite quickly, whereas the cheetah, the leopard doesn't really need high speed movement. That They bulge out there and they leave a very nice distinct mark in the sand. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we are looking for any of those really, but I saw some just before there that are not very easy to, to show you on the camera in this light. Lighting is also a very important aspect and when it's very overcast it's hard to see tracks because you can't see the angle and the shadows are very very deceptive you need the shadows anyway we're going to keep searching here for a little while longer and in the meantime let's go back over to sydney who's doing the same and then there's fresh fresh elephants tracks going down there I am now still on uh, towards the west, the east, the western side of the game drive. Just to try and see, I've got some tracks here, but it's not for the cats. This one I've got here, still I'm not winning with the cats at the moment. Maybe our luck is going to be much more towards the way we are going because uh, from down this side it seems to be very much quiet. I don't have, has, I, I, I'm not, I'm battling to hear the FC, I'm not getting anything from the FC at the moment. Let me just check it here. I am battling to get hold of the question from the FC, I don't know, maybe there's something wrong with my communication this side. So FC, could you please give me the question back? I am not hearing anything. I, 
I am not uh, getting the questions. So now while I'm still fine-tuning my communication, let's go to Steve. Well, the gremlins are all over the place. Well, we are back exactly where Hosanna was left this morning. We're going to have one more little little peek in here. Aubrey from Vuitella came on the radio a moment ago and said he heard some alarm calls around um, north of Vuitella Dam, so he's following up. We're going to go there now. I'm just going to have one, one more little peek in here. See if he's not just lying up. Oopsie. Sorry, Seb. We're not just lying down here in the drainage that we can't see. Very camouflaged, these animals, ladies and gentlemen. Very camouflaged. This is an area that uh, we spent a lot of time with Tandi and Tlalamba. The whole of February, it seems, just this side and that side. It's really, really cool to have spent that time with her when the little fur ball was just a little fur ball. <laughs> There's nothing much more, just big feet, cuddly little face. Could be anywhere. Okay, well I don't see anything in here. We're going to go around to to Voyatella again and see if we can assist Aubrey with those alarm calls. Alarm calls are a great way to find animals, but tracking is a good way. Alarm calls is much more real in the moment. But there were no tracks coming out. I didn't find any tracks, so very hard to say. He might still be here, and those might be alarm calling at some other leopard that we haven't been paying attention to this morning. Maybe Tingana coming back in. This is also an area Tandi likes to spend a bit of time. But if he is around here, he's probably very flat. So if we don't come right by the watching hole, well, we'll come back in this area just before dark as it gets to that sort of time where the coolness and the light is in favor for the leopard and they will slowly start moving, looking for their meal. Alrighty. So how is everybody doing on this lovely Sunday afternoon? It is Sunday in South Africa. Ooh, David, there's a few. The best alarm calls, monkeys are very, very reliable. Very. Kind of like that. But high pitch and the monkeys also look. So you'll look up in a tree and you'll see the monkeys and you'll be like, okay, cool, let's look. Let's look that way. And uh, quite often you find them. Kudu and Nyala are also quite reliable. Bushbuck are in the same category. Although the other day we had Kudu alarm calling. I was on Tortured with Senzo and we had Kudu alarm call and we couldn't find the animal. So maybe the animal was skittish and it just moved away from us or it had been there and the smells were sort of still around and it scared the kudu. So they are quite, I find kudu and bushbuck you know, very reliable. In parlor as well, you've just got to differentiate the difference between the alarm call and the rutting call. And when the alarm, uh, the impala alarm, it's a, a high pitched quick snort. But when, when he's rutting, it's a very similar sound, but it's more, it's longer and more forced. <laughs> that is my analogy of it. Um, Franklin can be quite good, but we've noticed also that sometimes they don't call if they see an animal. They just sit there and they freeze. Squirrels, I've given up on squirrels. Squirrels, I don't like squirrels. Monkeys and baboons, very good. Very, very good. Baboons make their very... Wow! Wow! Gets everyone's attention. I think I got you all there, did I? Yeah, that was the... Seb even jumped in his seat. <laughs> so, uh, baboons are very good. They also will be up a tree and will look in the direction. Um, um, what else I'm thinking? Seb, can you think of another animal that's quite sort of common that we that we utilize? I think the, the most obvious ones and the, the best ones are there. Obviously there's other areas. 
Guinea fowl up. Guinea fowl are quite good. They do that. Tick, 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 together and they're doing the afternoon together so that's completely false at that time of day but in the middle of the day you find them we got Hosanna at room 11 Jitwa one afternoon or one morning because of that but as the Sun starts setting it's not reliable at all um, it's sort of a contact call so that is helpful go away birds I suppose are also quite useful um, I can't say I've, I've ever found anything successfully using go away birds because they move quite a lot and it's hard to really keep up with where they're moving Franklin's will explode out of a bush and make that like tick, 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 tick. okay well we're going to go back over to Sydney it seems like he's sorted out his earpiece let's hope he can hear what we're all saying my apologies for the communications earlier i was experiencing a little bit of a problem here with my communication system but now i think i am sorted and i am now carrying on looking for some of the big cats in the game reserve no sign yet of the cats where i am maybe these cats are resting not sure, maybe they have caught something. David, the vendor name for a leopard is Ngwe, Ngwe. Ngwe is a leopard. I've got uh, some of the very beautiful antelopes here with me. I am so very lucky today to find both male and females together, mostly when it comes to these kind of animals, nyalas. Since I've been here, I always see the females together with the young males, but to find three males together with one female is something very rare. So the females don't carry horns at all. Males, they carry horns. Look at that. She is the only female I am seeing here. If you don't look nicely, you might even think this is a different species. So they are not identical at all. So these males, they normally work together, but during breeding season is when the dominant one will go then with the family for breeding purposes. Look at that, you can see the tips of the horns are very much uh, white. Mostly when the tips of the horns are like this, it means that animal is getting old. And when it's very, very old, the tips then breaks off. Look at some of the disruption markings, the markings that are there just to confuse any predator. Very much hairy. They've got a mane, it's like a mane. Kim, I also love Nyalas a lot. They are such very much cute and it's interesting seeing them challenging each other for territorial purposes. The fight amongst the Nyalas is the one of the best fights amongst all the antelopes because it's associated with body language and that is how they provoke each other. I love Nyala fightings. So I'm going to carry on now and see if we can find something. The king Nyalas, they are browsers. They eat quite a lot of uh, 
leaves from the small trees growing. But these animals sometimes browsers and grazers, they tend to feed on grass when they are browsers. Sometimes grazers also eat some of the leaves sometimes. That is determined by the season and what is happening in the surrounding. When there's too much drought, animals, they give us surprises sometimes. We see things that are not documented happening. So now I am going to carry on and see if we can find something interesting. So now we are going to Mara and see some of the beautiful elephants of Africa. Good, back. So I'm doing singing tests, as you can hear, because Archie was saying he didn't have my audio. Apologies. I've got gremlins. The gremlins followed me all the way here. Anyways, we have we have got like I don't know how many elephants did you say? A hundred? Hey, Archie, easy. Maybe more. Maybe 150 elephants, all in this area. There are so many. It's one of my favourite spots in the triangle. If you ever come and visit. Um, you just need to come to this, I don't even know what this marsh is called, but it's beautiful. And it's in the triangle, it's quite close to the Olololo gate. It is stunning. And if you are an elephant and you like to eat grass, or if you're any animal and you like to eat grass, why would you not want to come here? It's beautiful, it's lush. There's lots of little depressions and luggers, aka drainage lines, and mud wallows. I mean, you can have a great time, especially if you're a young elephant. You might want to chase the birds too, that could be quite exciting. I'm always up for little baby elephants chasing birds. That's one of the most awesome things to see. Now, these are different storks. These are white storks. Well, that big one, and then there's egrets at the back, cattle egrets. So, another stork to add to the list today. We're doing well on birds so far. We'll see how many more we can add up. Maybe we get some scallows to rockers and things. Oh, uh, hello, little sleepy pants. Look at that little elephant. Oh, no, not sleeping. Just a quick cat nap. Fair enough. Now you can also see that the camera is just moving a little bit. Like I said, it's been quite windy and now that we're out in the open, the wind has picked up and our camera is very much exposed. So it does bounce and bobble around a little bit. Archie's holding on as tight as he can. Oh, how sweet is that? A little elephant just having a nap. Now, yesterday we had a funny moment. We were, we were actually a good laugh. It was during the one hour Nat Geo Kids segment. Oh my goodness. It was very, very, very funny because we had an elephant bull, one of these bulls, I suspect, chase, and I kid you not, for, I don't know, a couple of hundred meters, chase a female. <laughs> he obviously wanted to mate with her, and she was having none of it, so she ran away. Um, Rosalind, now, you have a very nice question, but Louise was not very nice to me today. Louise is directing for all of you, so Rosalind's question was about what is the lo loudest animal out here, and then Louise quickly commented and said, accept me. Remember, Brent Leo Smith is still the loudest thing in the world. I kid you not, when he talks on the radio, it can be on volume one and it still blares. And Archie and I go, ah, like nails on a chalk chalkboard. So Brent's not here to defend himself. Ha ha ha. So Brent's the loudest. And then you're probably going to get something like cicadas afterwards, maybe a lion's roar. Um, Though an elephant trumpet is fairly deafening as well. You know, I'm trying to think, most animals are silent, except the wildebeest at the moment. They just don't stop making noise. They just... That's all you hear at the moment along the river, which is quite cool. So, yeah, so everyone's actually fairly quiet. Most of the time they don't make a lot of noise except for the wildebeest. Oh, hang on. What's happening here? This is... This is interesting. Okay, so we've got the big bull on the left. You can see him. And then the one with his bottom towards us, that's another elephant bull there. Now, he's much smaller in sort of height, but he's got a good set of ivory on him, whereas the bull on the left is actually much taller and I suspect a little bit older. And he just basically showed that younger bull that he was not happy with him getting close to the cow that is just on the other side. Now, I don't know. Maybe she could be coming into estrus again. I mean, her calf... Let's see if her little calf is probably around two or three years old. Although she probably would be already pregnant then. 
you know, they have a calf every four to five years. And out here, living is quite good, so it might even be sooner than that, maybe every four years or so. But he absolutely dwarfs that cow. You're a big boy. And you can see he's also secreting slightly from his temporal glands. I think he might just be coming out of must. And uh, for those of you that have no idea what must is, I shouldn't just be throwing these words around. It's basically the excited state that the males get into when they want to mate with the females. And that's one of the indicators, as well as a number of different things. And um, the reason why I think that is because he's got some wet patches between his legs, but they're drying up. So and that's the other indication, is that they dribble urine. I'm so sorry, Louise. Please, can I have that again? Who asked that wonderful question about the elephants? Now I wait for the delay. <laughs> Ma! Yo, Margarita, you wanted to know if these elephants are, if it's just um, one family group or do they belong to different family groups? I would say, I reckon, let me stand up. Apologies, I'm going to shake the car because I was sitting down. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to climb out of the vehicle. So, right. Hello. Fix my hat. I'm going to point now. So obviously we're in the marsh, great feeding area. There's lots of different animals that are feeding in this grass. Everybody is, is quite happy as there's lots of water around, there's a lot of food, they don't need to fight over it. So if, should we start down there? Should we go from right to left? That down over there, Margarita, in the corner, those group of elephants, that looks like they could probably be one family group. Must remember with elephants, they don't always feed on top of one another. They can also spread out a couple of hundred meters and graze quite happily. But just the way that they're sort of semi-gathered, and then maybe we've got another smaller group at the back there or perhaps they are some bulls and things like that some loners it's very difficult they're very far away and then i definitely think we've got a group here in the middle this group i think would belong to one family herd i'm gonna go ahead and say we maybe have four or five different family groups of elephants that we're looking at at the moment i'm also including the ones you can't see on the other side so i think and they're quite like i said they're quite happy to move together they're all going to slowly move back down and into the forest where they'll spend the night you can see it's windy my hair it's uncontrollable here in the Mara. Just clip it. I've just got clips everywhere, and then this just somehow finds ways to blow out from underneath my hat. I was really hoping we were going to get some action with these bulls, though, but it doesn't seem like it. But a very peaceful scene nonetheless. It's always really nice to watch the elephants. But we'll probably move on because I'm itching to try and find you all some lions. And I need to check the forest line in order to try and find you with some leons. Maybe the Triangle Boys are around, or perhaps the Mara River Pride will be about. So and that's what we're going to do now. And yeah, but you were wondering, well, I don't know, because I need to go and find them. So that's going to be the plan now, is that we're going to go and find the lions, because that's what I'd like to do. And I don't have much time to search, unfortunately, as we do not have a ranger with us to accompany us in the darkness, because my vehicle does not allow for it. <laughs> Right, let's go across to Sydney, who is still trying to locate those creatures with spots. Yes, yeah, so we're doing big loops and nothing of yet, folks, but this is an area now on our western side that is officially fully underway with regards to winter. You can see there's not a single leaf on the trees. We're quite high up on what we call the catena or the slope. And you can see that all the trees have pretty much lost their leaves. Uh, it's very dry. There's a fire index of six today. Um, and we've got to be very careful with regards to, to burning. Because of the wind and the dryness, if a fire happened to ignite now, we could have some seriously huge amounts of area could be burnt down. So we have to be very careful. And that is why fire breaks get put in. But you can see all these trees. Months ago, this area was full, full, full of leaves. And all that organic material has fallen on the ground. There's an enormous amount of termite activity on the top of these hills here with really big termite mounds. Excuse me. And this is an area where we're hoping to find an aardvark at some stage. Uh, we saw one from the drone a few nights back, uh, further north from where we are now. And this is an area that Hukumuri likes to hang out because the, the, the diggings have provided nice sort of holes for warthogs in the ground. 
Uh, so we're just having one little look over here, see anything we can see, but amazing how it's changed from the summer months. And that is why these trees that you find up on the slope, the, the red bush willows are such hard wood because they grow in the summer and then in the winter time they grow very, they don't grow, they just sort of go dormant because there's no photosynthesis happening. Uh, they can't get access to the water so they just drop their leaves off. And from an ecological point of view, very, very important because all of that is being recycled back into to the soil. If you do find any plants up here with leaves on, well that means they've got access to the water and they're doing very well. Hello Paula, well we, the, the rain varies and we can have a look at this little herd of impala that is enjoying the dryness up here. Have you guys seen hukumuri anywhere or hosana? Any leopards? Um, the rainfall can vary, but it's anywhere from 250 to 3, maybe 400 millimeters of, of rain a year. Um, the savanna biome can get up to about as high as 850, but no, not really more than that. But in this area, it doesn't get lower than about 150. Uh, but you do get years where it can due to, to drought and the rains just don't come. Uh, but the savanna needs a regular rain seasonal rain coming in the summer months and we go through wet and dry periods and we've just come through last year I think this last season was quite a nice wet period which enables the animals to get nice and bulky again and build up and you can see these impala are enjoying this winter forage of grass up at the top of the hill here they have the potential to be mixed feeders so they can feed on whatever is good at the time and there's no leaves at all maybe there's some small forbs that they're feeding on there but I think they're feeding on some grass nice big herd once again the wind seems to have died down a little bit now just moving around quite camouflaged actually I mean to our our color vision they, they, they kind of stand out but to a black and white seeing predator they actually are quite difficult to spot unless they move with that three-toned sort of body color and the back is being quite dark the side a bit lighter and the belly white so it's a term called counter shading it helps them to blend in with the surroundings you can see they're quite relaxed there's no evident predator in the immediate area well we're going to leave these very camouflaged impala and let's go over to Sydney and see if we can spot him with his camouflaged shirt love life I am now uh, at the Buffalo's Hook area in order to see if I can pick up some of the very much interesting cats here. So, but for now, I am going to show you something very much interesting here. I will show you these termite mounds. I can see they've built quite a very big house here, not very far away from where we are. So if you can check here where I'm climbing now, I'm climbing a very big house. It's like a pile of sand here so this is a big house it started from very much low and it has been done by these interesting insects the termites you know the termites when they're building this they have got a very interesting behavior which is called trophylaxis trophylaxis is whereby these termites they defecate the queen defecates and these youngsters the newborn must have to eat droppings from their mother and when this is done that is when you get things such as methane gas because when the methane gas comes it comes as of the bacteria from inside the stomach of these insects these insects are one of the insects which are because of in get in where these insects because they eat the wood this wood is very much difficult to digest and because of that they have to get some of the digestive bacteria so these digestive bacteria they survive in the stomach of these termites so when the food goes in there is when it's going to get broken down and after that they will then defecate when they defecate the little ones must come and kill and eat 
stra straight from the excretory opening. It is called anal trophallaxis. So they go and get these droppings as they come out. Right from the anal opening, you will see them queuing, trying to eat those kind of droppings. So, which is also another way of these insects to minimize the load of the droppings in the termite mound. So you can see these insects are very much clever. So if you can check, their droppings again is going to be recycled and work because it comes out with some of the indigestible material. So when they come out, they take again the very same droppings and they use them in order to build the nest. That is why if you go in there, you will not see any of the frass. Frass is just a term referring to the droppings of the insects. So you can see that these insects, they don't only recycle outside here. They don't only recycle the vegetation. So the nutrient cycle is outside happening. They also recycle. Their own droppings is used by other ones inside, and they use the very same thing again in order to build the nest. You can see they don't waste anything. So they make sure that everything is used twice or more than twice again. So now I am going to go back to my search and see if we can find something. So my apologies, I am using the communication from Senzo. So I'm not using the, the, the communication from the original communication cord. So every time I'll be giving Senzo my, uh, my wire so that I'm able to hear the FC asking questions. Well, I don't know what's happened there with Sydney's signal. He must be going through one of those little tricky signal bits. But don't worry, we're right up on top. So we've got, I think we've got pretty decent signal here. And we keep going around. I'm glad Sydney was talking to you about a term amount. I was going to talk about one, but he's done it for me. The aardvark could potentially, this is an area that we, I'm pretty sure we're going to find one one of these days. Lots and lots of diggings happening around on the top here. And we got one, as I said, from the drone. It looked quite funny because it's, it's, it's quite a unit of an animal. You're running around constantly. Constantly. Nikita, I've never seen an aardvark in the Sabi Sands. I think I've seen six, six aardvarks in my life. Uh, Namibia is a great place to go and have a look. I got two in the Kruger Park. Well, here's a lonesome fellow. Oh, he's on his own. That's not a good idea, being on your own out here. You get very jumpy. No one to watch your back. Prime candidate for a predator to pick off a lonesome animal. See how he's got to put his head up and then listen. And then he's got to put his head down. But then if something makes a noise, he's got to put his head up again. So it's that time spent feeding and with your head up that is important to notice. And that's what the importance of being in a herd is, is you can spend a lot more time having a little sleep. It's the same as what goes on with us. If we go camping out here, we go walking in the wilderness and we spend the night sleeping around a fire. Um, if there's only one of you, you're going to have a very hard time because someone's got to keep the fire going and someone's got to make sure that hyena don't come and snatch a piece of someone's face. But if there's two of you, well, then you can at least divide up the time spent awake. Three of you, you could divide it once more. But if there's eight of you, well, then you can each do an hour in the night and the rest of you can sleep. So it's a very good way to think about it. For that one hour, you can spend defending everybody and the rest of the time you can know that someone's watching out and you can go right back to sleep. Okay, well it seems like Sydney has found some signal and something rather large as well. I managed to find one of the big animals you can see is an elephant head. So these elephants are very much stationary feeding. Look at those ears. This is beautiful. This one is coming right straight 
She just wants to give us a nice posture for the pictures. Look at that. He's trying to pick up something on the ground. So this is how this sniff and look at the toes. You can clearly see the toes. So they, they use the trunk in order to also pick up the information on the ground here. So they will know about a lot of things. Let's see what it's going to do with the stick. Oh, it took that stick to the mouth. It's breaking it. It's not even fresh. It's a very dry stick. I'm not too sure what this elephant is trying to do. Look at that. So they use these legs in order to dig for the water during the dry season. Lori, the elephants, they are not monogamous. So the elephants are polygamous. That is why you find them walking in these big heads. But these males, they are just there in order to breed. But when it comes to the powers, they are not decision makers. They take orders coming from the females, which is a good thing because not a lot of animals have that. You can see this elephant has got also some dust uh, right on the body. If you can go up a little bit, I can see there there's some of the of the of the soil is is hanging there. You can see that this elephant was picking up the soil from the ground and throwing it up to the body. This is what they do when they're trying to also control their body temperature. The elephants can be very much destructive. Look, the little ones are playing there. Bro, I mean, the elephants, unfortunately, they are not part of the uh, territorial animals. Elephants are part of what is called a home range. A territory takes place within a home range. Home range, it means these animals can just go anywhere and everywhere for survival, for feeding purposes. Territory has got something to do with mating and breeding. It's an area demarcated within a home range for breeding purposes. And the territory has to be defended. Home range is not defended. And the home range uh, can overlap. Territories cannot overlap. Once the territory overlaps, then a fight must take place. So it means now these elephants might be feeding, heading towards Buffalo's Hook as we are not very far away from the Buffalo's Hook Dam. And that is the area they are depending on for water availabilities. So being part of the home range gives elephants much more opportunities to go and feed and drink anywhere and everywhere. Because the territorial animals they depend on certain water holes, but when they're dry, they, they also trespass and have water in different areas. Look at what that one is doing. Very much peaceful. Look at that. A safari, Sally, uh, the animals, when it comes to the colors, is very much, very much difficult for them to distinguish in colors. But yes, some of them can. Elephants, I am not too sure, but I know the elephants don't like things such as flashlight. That one, they can be able to sense it. They can be able to see it. So when it comes to the colors, not too sure which colors they can be able to determine. You can see that uh, this this elephant we are watching now has not been going through stress for quite a long time. Elephants, when when they are under stress, you can easily read that from the side of their 
of their head. So if there's any kind of gland coming down, it's telling you that it was a sign of stress. But looking at this one, I can see there that there is nothing fresh which is leaking down between the eye and the ear. So it means it has been in a very good condition for quite a long time now. Those that has been under stress, that is where you must check. So these animals, they've got to spend I didn't copy nicely the name of the viewer who asked a question about elephants going to mast. The elephants, the ones that go on mast, a Jackson, the elephants that go on mast is only the males. And these males, they don't go on mast twice a year. Mast is kind of an unpredictable condition which is taking place once a year for about seven consecutive days up to two weeks. Some can be less, some can be more than that. So they reach maturity when they're about 12 years. After that is when they can be able to go on must. It's a very short period, but by that period, the elephants are very much temperamental. So let's see, now that I found the elephant, still not yet the cats, Steve is also doing some trekking where he is. Let's see, maybe Steve has got some of the tracks already. Mm, well, I'm always looking for tracks, always. What is this here? That is tracks of a male leopard heading directly from, from that direction. It's not very clear to see in the sand. Now you can actually see it now over my right shoulder there. I'll just jump out and I can show you. Can you see these here, Seb? Okay, so which one are you looking at? This one? This one? Are you looking back? Okay, so here's the toes, the four toes in the front, one, two, three pads. Now the size, now we talk about what advice do you have for track, someone was asking me, always measure it, it's going to take time before you can see the track, here is the, let me just get a little stick, here's the track, here's the back, and here's the front. So by doing that you can measure it quite nicely, and that's just about 10 centimeters, it's easily to confuse lion and a leopard track if you don't look at the size but the size of a lion track is far bigger than a leopard track and if I show you here again here is the back pad you can see how wide it is but if I draw a line there the outside toe look how wide it is in a female leopard it's quite narrow there that outside toe doesn't extend as much males have just got really really big feet and he has walked pretty slowly because this is actually registering which means that the one foot is in the other foot. He stepped on the footprints. And let's see if we can follow this a bit. It's been quite windy. It's kind of headed straight down the road here towards the power lines, which then often goes out west. Let's have a look. I haven't been on this road in the last few days, but they've come straight from power lines, straight from Voyatella, straight from sort of quarantine area where we've been all morning. Now, I'm not ever going to assume I know which leopard it is. It's a male leopard. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> it's heading in this direction. No one's driven over it. Maurice, it's a great question. You know, I, I don't know what t uh, Hosanna feels. But, I mean, I think he does feel a relative sort of sense of security knowing his... He's in the area. He hasn't been given any sort of negative feedback by his pops. He hasn't been chased away. He's had a few meals stolen from him, but all in all, it's been quite a nice sort of comfortable affair for him. I think it's quite off-putting for any 
any young predator to be moving away from an area that they're familiar with and then oh, there they're still going an area that they're familiar with and then uh, having to go somewhere where all the smells are new the males are new the females are new you don't know the drainage lines the topography I think that's a little bit unsettling but I think it can also be quite quite cool for a cat to go into new era I loved going traveling and new experiences or whatever and it's a bit daunting in the beginning but daunting you don't know how to look after yourself but you know we have to learn and he's learned very well he's a very successful young leopard but yeah I think he's finding it quite safe and secure I don't know what's going through his mind though but he seems to be enjoying himself here although his dad is stealing a bit of his food but I mean if he was somewhere else the male who stole his food would probably do more than just steal his food he'd probably give him a bit of a hiding okay well I've lost those tracks now but they were heading directly west here there's a nice raptor look at that beautiful lizard buzzard just land in the top of the tree there and you can see that very characteristic black stripe on the throat and the barred chest beautiful bird very black eye that sort of pinkish sort of sear but very easy to identify by seeing that that black stripe on the throat got some white on the tail as well it's a medium sized one of the medium sized small raptors that we get here and as the name lizard buzzard implies they do feed on lizards but they'll feed on small birds on rodents snakes he just took off from a patch over there so I'm flying directly towards us he's going to have a bit of a poo there we go turn around there you can see that stripe now very easy and very characteristic I remember back in the day when I was still training, uh, my trainer, we stopped at a bird like this and he asked me what's that. I said, oh, I'm not really into birds. He gave me a very stern look. And um, since then I've put in a lot of effort. But it just takes one bird at a time. Practice. Get used to it. No, ooh, see how he does that with his head? The raptor's able to sort of... Um, push their head, their eyes into sort of a binocular sort of vision so when they kind of move that that sideways sort of movement we almost think that they're just sort of keying in or or zooming into something I'd love to be able to to do that with my eyes hey Seb yeah, sure. I do use my do use my binoculars anyway Taylor is up in the Mara and I think she's moved off from her elephants and she's found a lovely zebra who's doing something I love to imitate from time to time in the dust. They see me rolling, they're hating, controlling, trying to catch me rolling dirty, trying to catch me rolling dirty, trying to catch me. <laughs> I think I've always wanted to do that and I've never had the chance to, but I did it. Can check that off of my bucket list. But here we have some zebras who are enjoying an afternoon rolling the dust which is awesome. I do enjoy any animal that is either a bathing in the water, obviously, or rolling around in the dust. And it's quite funny, and I've told you this before, and most horsey people will know this, or if you've owned horses before, when one, ze one zebra, one horse rolls or defecates, and normally it's the more dominant one, they all copy. They all go and do exactly the same thing. Watch, now watch these youngsters, which they're all going to try and probably sit on top of one another and roll in exactly the same spot. But that seems to be a nice little place there, kicking up lots of dust. Now, if you are a new viewer, welcome, because you're probably wondering what on earth are these animals doing? <laughs> but lots of different animals cover themselves in dust, obviously in very different ways. Uh, elephants will use their trunks to scoop up dust and throw it over their bodies. However, the rest of them, the rest of the mammals, kind of have to roll around like this. And what that will do uh, is it helps suffocate any of the little parasites that are living on their body. So particularly lice will end up being suffocated. Maybe the small tick larvae as well. However, I don't think a big tick, like a born tick or anything like that, or the soft gray ticks would really be affected too much by the dust. But the larvae and the smaller mites and things, I think, would definitely be suffocated. And then, of course, birds use a very interesting technique of um, moving their wings around and ruffling their feathers, which is quite great to see. Hmm. Now, 
Margarita, you're just making me thirsty with your name. Thank you for that. Um, you've asked about the differences between, I suppose, male and female zebra and if males are a bit larger. So, Margarita, it's actually quite difficult to tell the, the, the sex between, uh, I suppose, this, again, the same thing goes with horses. And this really just comes with a lot of practice and experience in looking at these animals. Typically, the stallions, the males, are a lot uh, sort of more muscled up. They have a very thick neck. They've got big shoulders and rather large hindquarters. So you can see the zebra on the right-hand side is a mare because she's got a bulging belly. There's a foal inside there. She hasn't indulged on too much grass. I don't know if there's such a thing. Oh no, I do. Uh, yes, I remember one horse of mine in particular that indulged in too much grass. Um, otherwise, it can be quite tricky. Um, if you also, well, yeah, it, it, it's difficult to say. And then normally with the stallions, they're either the ones that are up in front leading the herd, or maybe in this case, that actually looks like it could be the stallion, just watching, keeping an eye on us saying, you don't get too close to my ladies. Those stallions are very protective over their girls, so we call it a harem. But um, it's hard to say right now. But uh, you, you can quite easily, if they're going to drink at the water, any sort of water's edge, um, what you got over there, then you can tell the difference quite easy. Oh, buffalo! Well spotted. A little herd of buffalo just resting up in the distance. Okay, well, we are heading into the Marsh Breakaway Pride Alliance territory, so I'm going to have a quick scan for them and maybe we find them. But off you go back to some more elephants in South Africa. So the elephants are very much stationary feeding here and little ones are just playing, pushing each other, which is very good in order to maintain the relationships here amongst this herd. It is not quite a very big herd, small herd. Look at that. This is very much beautiful. I can see <clears throat> there's another vehicle. Uh, Hazel, the elephants can survive up to 65 years. What kills the elephants mostly is old age. When the elephants are very much old, they start losing their teeth. And when the tooth breaks, that is where now we are going to have problem because they are not going to digest. They are not going to chew anything. That is what normally kills them. They normally die from starvation. You can see those other ones were just pushing each other earlier. The elephants are very much peaceful animals. You can see they are chasing each other. Not too sure what is the problem. See, that is a warning that something is not right there. So when they are not happy with something, you see they will look now, it's running, you can see they are playing. They are just irritating each other, those two. So the elephants, they are very much interesting because if one of the female dies when she has got the babies, she can take over lactation and nurse the little one. So the skin is very much hard. They are part of the pachyderms, those animals such as the rhinos and wattrogs and hippopotamus and elephants, they have got very hard skin. So now while I'm going to carry on looking for the cats, let's see, Steve has got a lovely kudu at the moment. Yes, we do. It's very, very beautiful. She's on her own and she's quite relaxed. Very inconspicuous when they are in the thickets. But when they come out into the open like that, their little awkward walk, their front foot steps and then their back foot steps on the same spot and they walk very gently, ears always forward, listening to what is going to be approaching in the distance. You can see the direct registering happening means of silent walking and very long long legs amazing jumpers kudu there's a magpie shrike following her around hoping for an easy meal as she moves across the open clearing 
She'll feel a little bit more comfortable on the other side once she reaches the thicket. Probably my favorite antelope, the kudu. The second one coming in from the left now, Seb. You always, you always miscount them. Lou said they're her favorite as well. You always miscount kudu because you think you've seen them all and then suddenly more materialize out of the bushes. Men and moo, I don't think so. I think, you know, the animals are constantly growing fur. I don't think there's any sort of, uh, sort of shedding that happens. They, they just have the ability to pile erect, to, to stand that fur up, to allow themselves to keep warm as a sort of buffering insulation. But it doesn't get that cold out here. I mean, you probably when you watch me on my morning drives, you'd probably think I'm lying, but I just struggle with the cold. These animals, they get quite used to it. They tuck themselves in, they're constantly eating. They're constantly metabolizing, so they're constantly getting warm inside. And that is what keeps them in good stead during the cold months. But I'm not familiar with them actually having a, a really shaggy winter coat that they get lost in the summer. They always look very similar. You only might see a little bit of a difference in the early morning as that hair stands up a bit more, almost like with us. We have, um, what's the word? Goosebumps. What we call them kudu bumps in this case. Antelope bumps. Beautiful spots on the cheek, those enormous ears, a really elegant animal and slowly but surely they just slowly disappear into the thickets, merging with the vegetation. Linda, that bump that you see there is actually a, a, a line of fur, almost like a little mane of fur. And the purpose it serves is exactly camouflage. So if the kudu had a smooth round back, it would stand out a lot more in that vegetation. But it's got this little bit of hair on the back of the neck and down the back all the way down to the tail. And what that does is it takes away that, th that sort of that smooth back line, takes away the actual outline. So they blend in with the background quite nicely. If a kudu is standing sort of side onto you in the thick bush, unless you look really, really closely, you don't really see its shape or its outline. So that's the major purpose of that. The stripes included are break them up with sort of the, the parallel or vertical vegetation. The lines sort of blend them in there so they lose all three-dimensional characteristics. Okay, so I didn't quite hear what Lou said to me there, but I know we're going to be going over to Sydney. Let's go see what he has. I have got a very lovely group of kudus. You can see they are right on top of the termite mound. They are watching the elephants feeding. You can see the elephant right next to them. This is amazing. Quite a lot of kudus together watching the elephants one of the animals who trust the termites because look at that whole family of kudus right on top those those termites can be able to support the 5000 kilograms of the elephant kudus they can weigh just 270 kilogram it's nothing you can see that those ants they build this the termites they build this termite mound nicely look at that kudus are trying to feed there now so you can see that some of them, they are feeling cold a little bit because their hairs are raised. The, the mane that you are seeing there now, that line of hairs behind the neck, look at that. That is beautiful. That mane is the one we can use in order to check the condition of this kudu. That mane, together with the stripes, white stripes you are seeing on the side of the bodies, will tell you if this kudu is in a good condition or not. When the kudu is not in a good condition, the stripes, they faint. And also, when the kudu is not in a good condition, the mane behind the neck, it goes down. When that mane is flat, it means they are not in good condition. And normally, when it's like that, is when there is a shortage of calcium. That is when they must go then and find some of the 
uh, old bones and chew them to regain calcium. These animals can jump very high. Kudus can jump two to four meters high fence from just a standing position. So the males, they look very much beautiful than the females. The child of the universe, the kudu females, if you look at them, they are very way much bigger than the nyala. And the color is different. The nyala is reddish brown. And the kudu, you can see there, is much more gray. The nyalas, the, the tails of the nyalas and the kudus, they look more or less the same because they both have fluffy hairs. But when it comes to the males, the difference is that the kudus, the males, they've got long, long horns. And the spiral of the horns can go up to three. And something else is that the male nyalas are very much fluffy and the kudus, they have got very short hairs. So look at that together with the little ones. <laughs> this is beautiful. So now the kudus might be looking for the benefits because the trees which has got the leaves now high up, they cannot access them. The, the elephants maybe will drag some of the branches for the kudus to eat. Safari Sally, that is quite a very good question. You can tell the age of the kudu from the horns. When the kudus are just about five days old after birth, you will see the buds. The buds is this place where the horns are going to come out. And when the kudu is just about 12, 12 months, is when you will see the horns starting to come out. When these kudus are about 18 months, you will see now that the horns are in are starting to curve in, but they complete the cycle of those horns in three to five years in order for them to get the whole three spirals. So you can tell the kudus, Sally, at the age of the kudus from the development of horns. Look at that. You can see these animals are just feeding. All of them are feeding, but they're not eating. So these are part of the ruminants. They can collect food now. When resting, they can be able to again take back food to their mouth and chew some cart. These kudus are in a very good condition, as if we are now still during the rainy season. Unbelievable that the vegetation is dry at the moment. If you look at the ischium, the ischium is that bone, hip bone at the back. Normally, when the animals are not in a good condition, you will see it together with the ribs coming out. Just from the look of the kudus, you can be able to tell if it's in a good condition or not when starting to see the ribs, whether condition is fair, poor. Paula, most of these animals, they reach maturity when they're about two years, but they start to breed when they're about four and above years. So the level of maturity, two years, they are going to reach maturity, but for breeding purposes, it's going to come four years and above. If you can check, the kudus and the impalas, there's something I've realized. These animals, they don't give birth with quite a lot of males. The females are always in numbers higher than the number of males in these areas. And which is good in order to protect the, the species. So the ratio is that the females must have to be uh, a lot than the, the males.
So I can hear that now uh, some other birds has arrived, the ox pecas. So these ox pecas, they help these animals because they try to clean also by the inaccessible areas. Now I will carry on and see if I can find any of the interesting cats. Let's see Steve on the other side how he's doing. Tricky cats indeed. Tricky, tricky cats. Well, we're going to move around. We're coming back around towards the watching hole. Voyatella and Gallego. Gallego watching hole is just up ahead here. This is where Hosanna was originally found sort of this morning. And then he moved off. But we know that he keeps coming back to these areas because it's bringing the animals. So. If you're not being very successful out there, well then move it towards the water. Oh, there's one of the coolest birds around on the floor. Oh no, he's up in the tree now, Seb. There he is. African hoopoo. How pretty is that? He gets, when he gets his head up like that, they're very excited. And, uh, and off he flies. He was too excited to stay on camera for very long. I think he's a bit nervous. He was a bit nervous. He didn't do his hair this morning. It was a little bit, it was a couple out of place. <laughs> so on that note, talking about uh, the animals, uh, it's been pretty quiet on the animal front. The wind has dropped down, so I think they might start moving out of the sort of these drainage depressions where they've been hiding away. And it's going to be time to come and drink because as soon as the wind starts dropping, it's kind of characteristic this time of afternoon. The wind really dies down and then it means it's a little bit safer out there for them to be moving. Um, when you can't hear anything because the wind is blowing all the leaves and rustling all the grass, it's a tricky, tricky business. But you, the animals, a lot of these animals have to drink every day. And that is why the leopards lie up in ambush in and around the watering holes. So we don't think he killed anything last night. He was still looking quite hungry this morning. Mmm, child of the universe. Leopards are very hard to track. Um, we don't really track anything else that's difficult. So we, honey badger, you know, tracking a honey badger is just nearly impossible. But, you know, most of the animals that we track on safari are big five game. So buffalo, lion, leopard, rhino, elephant, those sort of things. So you don't really spend too much time tracking the small inconspicuous ones. So aardvark, we don't track them. We love finding their tracks. Honey badger as well, but the amount of area that they can cover in an evening is enormous. And uh, so whether it's worthwhile trying to follow is very hard. Uh, so we don't follow them. But when it comes to the big five, I definitely say leopard are the hardest to track. And we have quite a lot of luck in this area, but a lot of the time what we do is we, well, what Herbie and Rexon will do is they'll suggest going and checking places and game paths and you pick up on their tracks because these animals have got certain patterns that they like to use and we saw it this evening or this morning with the drone. We were following Hosanna trying to help Tristan keep with him and he kept popping down onto game paths and then you go up and you pop down again. So if you know where those game paths are, you just keep sort of checking them because they're sandy, they're quiet for the animal to walk on. So you can have a bit more luck, but it's not an easy business, I can tell you that right now. Even if you know exactly where the animal's going, it's still not easy. There's a lot of time, practice, experience, and patience. Patience. You see Herbie sometimes getting a bit frustrated when he can't find, because he's very good at it, but still, it's still tricky. Still very, very tricky. Well, we just passed Gallego, watering hole. Didn't see anything, but there's no animals around, which is another worrying factor. Some zebra tracks there, they probably came down and drank. Important to just switch off every now and again and just have a little listen. Bring out our inner kudu or external kudu. Very quiet. It's not your volume button, I promise. There's nothing going on out here. 
We've had such a crazy week, I suppose. It's animals like it's Sunday today. We're just going to take the day off. <laughs> it's fair enough. Fair enough. Two days of wild dogs and leopards and coming out of our ears. Oh, Irene, you ask such an awesome question. Last night, was it last night? Was it this morning? Yesterday morning. Yesterday morning. So we're getting very confused because we're up very strange hours, Irene. We actually managed to find a cat on the, um, on the drone and it was in an area where Tandy and Tlalamba had been and we, could, we were watching it catch scrub hair or mice or whatever, we're not sure. But it was definitely a cat, so we thought, oh cool, and we called James in. It was during the TV show, he came all the way to the other side of the reserve. We got him in and we vectored him right into this cat and he said, it is an African wild cat. <laughs> so a little bit smaller than Tlalamba, but uh, the behavior and everything about it was so cat-like. So yes, and Tristan saw one the week before as well, up in that area, up in the north northeast. You do get wild cats, but they're very hard to come by, very hard. I know Taylor had one before she left for, for the north, but I've only seen a, a handful in my life. Um, we had a, a tame one in Botswana we were looking after for, for a, a, a research couple there, and it was a very cool cat, very, very cool. His name was Scotia and it had been bitten by a snake and stung by a scorpion and it didn't have much use of its back legs but it was still a phenomenal squirrel killer. Without good use of its back legs, it was still able to decapitate many a bird and many an animal. I was quite impressed with her. But she would sit outside the research because that was when I was training. She'd sit outside our lecture hall and all the animals would be going absolutely crazy and she'd just be looking up like, what? I don't understand. So it was difficult to listen to. We got 50 birds screaming and shouting. We were trying to give a lecture. It's, a, it's non-stop. Helps you to learn your alarm calls though. It's good for the students. Okay, well we're coming around more back to Voyatella watering hole. See if there's any sign of the little chief doing his thing. No doubt if he is around here, he'll be lying flat in a bush, eyeing out a dacre. Well, while we do that, let's go back over to Sydney and see what exactly he's getting up to. I am now going to focus much more towards the western side of the game reserve, as I indicated earlier. And I'm not here today, I am now still heading there, make use of some of the roads I have used earlier on on my way to that side, just to see if maybe there are some of the tracks on top of my tracks. Nothing at the moment on top of my tracks, all the way down from that side, but uh, Still, I have got a lot of hope that I might find these cats uh, this afternoon. So this is where I have last seen them. And before, the other colleagues saw them yesterday morning. no sign at the moment so it seems these cats are all together both the mother and the cub monique i didn't copy your question nicely but it's about trekking the best way uh Moline, the best way to learn uh, trekking. First thing is it must have to be during the dry season because it's easy to determine whether the track is fresh or not. During the rainy season the tracks when they are wet is difficult to judge because the moisture keeps the tracks look much fresher all the time. The best way to learn the trekking is now during the dry season and it must have to be early in the mornings 
Now when I'm driving, I must have to drive the road and come back to the same road and check if animals walk over my tracks and that is what is going to tell me if the track is fresh or not. Oh, I'm just meeting Steve now. He has been trying by this side of the game reserve. He's coming from the western side where I am now heading to. He's also doing quite a lot of trekking. I can see his head is off the vehicle all the time. Thank you. Enjoy. <laughs> So Steve has been looking for the animals just around here at Garago area. So, but I'm going to trespass and move further down much more towards the western side. So I can see. Monique, to become a good trekker, it took me more than almost 10 years. Yeah, it's something that I'm doing every day, but to be a very well sophisticated trekker, it, it, it does go with experience. Because we don't only trek the big animals, we also trek small animals. And trekking during the day, when the sun is too bright, it's also very much difficult. So when you are doing trekking, if you are at school learning some trekking, in the morning, you are going to get marks that are much more or less. During the daytime, the questions when they're difficult, they give you high marks. So now, let's see what is happening at the dam. Yes, well, the sun is slowly setting in the west and there's some beautiful cloud cover. It's making it absolutely gorgeous. And uh, slowly but surely, that is, well, that is Voetella uh, Lodge behind there. And slowly but surely, a herd of Impala are making their way to the pan to drink. There's a few there, and there's one already there. And those bushes there are the ones that Hosanna has been hiding in the last little while. But we can't see anything in there. We do have the ability with the, the thermal camera as well, so we would be able to spot him if he was maybe hiding in there, but we can't see him. There's one brave individual who's already made his way to the watering hole. They've been waiting all day for the wind to die down, but they can still smell him. The residual smell of a leopard is probably going to linger for a couple of days. But eventually the need to quench one's thirst. You can see how nervous he is though. Same story as the feeding, how much time you can spend with your head down. Very nervous. Tony, New Zealand, do you want to know about Impala versus Thompson's gazelles? I think they are larger. Um, the, the Impala most certainly in, in the Masai Mara are bigger than, than the Thompson's. Oh, there's a Dacre. Here he comes. That's the dam cam that you're seeing there in the tree with the light. And the Dacre are apparently water-independent animals, ladies and gentlemen, but yet they are constantly coming down to drink, constantly getting smashed by Hosanna. Tundi's favorite food. So right on cue, there's a, the Dacre coming down, they're daring each other. You see, they will all come down together because it's 
much safer as a unit coming down on your own but Tony your, to answer your question I think the Impalas are definitely bigger than um, than the Thompson's Gazelle uh, I'm looking at my book here and um, in the Springbok and Thompson Gazelle are quite similar I think in size and you know they're almost half the size not half but almost 10 15 kilograms less in size the Springbok to the Impala so I'm, I'm going to guess from what I saw when I was up there the Tommies were quite small very fast agile animals but not very big from a weight perspective but the Impala up in the Mara are bigger than these ones down here a lot of that's got to do with the vegetation and the food that they eat there's a male Daker coming in very slowly now they never walk in a straight line folks a Daker you'll never ever see a Daker winning on the catwalk competition because they cannot walk in a straight line they're constantly jiggering from left to right and when you track them as well they walking they never walk oh well he's walking in a straight line they're always off the road again but constantly up and down like a zigzag zigzag motion and you see he's also putting his back feet exactly where his um his front feet were but the way that he walks he actually kicks his toes into the ground so you get more of a toe track than actually a full heel track there we go he's realized that he actually was going that way the whole time and but he won't go straight there he'll turn a bit more <laughs> they are such funny animals the day well, he's gonna come in and drink with his fellow in parlor and the Nyala coming in the background but an animal that is very awkward at drinking all the way up in the Masemara Taylor has found one and when they go and drink well it's awesome to stand and watch they are quite awkward maybe we'll see them drink but there's some ox peckers also on this beautiful giraffe hello and those look like yellow bull dogs peckers which is quite nice because they're the more common ones aren't you and just two of them now the reason why we've actually come to this area was not to see the giraffe now that it's become almost a two-headed giraffe but in fact there was a male lion that has been lurking about for the last couple of days so I'm hoping that he's still around here somewhere and I thought but I think I'm wrong I thought that these giraffe would quite easily point the lying out to us by just staring into the grass but that does not seem to be happening today the giraffe are now staring at us and then they're staring back at the other giraffe which are already in the forest so it's been quite windy here almost every single afternoon and i've noticed this particular group of giraffe are doing exactly the same thing they come through here they browse on some of the smaller shrubs all day long then there's a, a bit of a quarry over here which fills up with water and then they'll drink from here and then they go down they don't quite go and into the forest but they go down into the lower lying valleys what's that noise there's a bird shouting maybe it was ox peckers having a bit of a fight although those ox peckers did already fly off she's looking quite round i'm sure you can all agree perhaps there's a little a little giraffe developing in her stomach wouldn't that be nice i guess we've been seeing lots and lots of babies and i keep hoping to see a giraffe being born again. That would be really amazing. Now, Siddhar, they don't really do walks in the Mara. Um, there is a section that's not quite part of the Triangle, or the Masamara National Reserve, um, where Camp uh, and Beyond Camp does some walks. Uh, they, I suppose, yes, any, any walk can potentially be dangerous, but we don't really need to worry because most of the time you're with a trained safari guide i mean if you're gonna go on walking on by yourself good luck have fun probably nothing will probably happen to you but obviously if you're with a person who knows how these animals behave um you know what the toughest thing is is that the grass is really long i mean i really have to use a lot of self-control self-control to keep myself in the cars because i just want to wander into the forest they look absolutely beautiful but um with all the tall grass around you can quite easily walk into a buffalo even a hippo and that's not going to be particularly nice so I think it, it would depend I know some of the conservancies in the surrounding areas do walks I mean like this would actually be quite a pretty area oh look there's some Egyptian geese down there on the Termite Mount because the grass has been grazed down quite nicely but any grass taller than this wouldn't be very pleasant to walk in or whatsoever that's quite nice don't you think the two Egyptian geese but I would like to I mean, sometimes we've had to walk when you get stranded and stuck and you don't have radio signal, you don't have anything like that, then you might have to walk to the closest road to try and find help. I've had to do that before. I think we've all had to do that before. Obviously, um, 
the, it's not something you can do every day, but in an emergency situation, I suppose we are trained guides, and that's better than somebody who has come from very, very far away away to see the animals for the first time wandering around on their own. That would not be great. Oh my goodness, Sydney, you are saving the day, unless I've missed some updates, but apparently you've got Mr. T. I've just arrived now. I managed to uh, reallocate Tingana. So I'm just trying to find a better position here so that we can have a good sighting. You can see there now that Tingana is very much relaxed. I think it has been a very long way for him, but the weather is on his favor, not too sure. What is tiring Tingana today? Look at that. So it means now Tingana might be thinking about going to the nearest water hole, which is the Kalago Pen at the moment. I can see that his belly still look very full for me. Last time I saw him a few days ago, the bellies were very, very full, showing that Tingana ate a lot. Quite very much difficult to see the leopards when they are lying down, especially in the tall grass. Tom, Tingana is the Duke of Juma. You can see he's getting very old, beautiful, still looking very much strong. Although he does sometimes experience problems here and then, leaping, recovering, but he looks very much fine now. Look at that. Oh, this is beautiful. So I'm going to now try and reposition myself and go much closer so that we can have a beautiful sighting. Senzo, are you OK here? Now you can see Tingana very much nicely. Uh, Trusty, that is very much true. It's very much easy to pass these kind of cats because they match the surrounding. They can be very much camouflaged. It's very much easy to pass them. That is why I prefer to track, because when I see the tracks, I am sure he is there. Not easy to see the, the cats from uh, the observation. Look at that. The last tracks I saw for Tingana, it was heading towards west, but that was about three days ago. So it means it's coming from that area. Look at that. Now this is stunning.
construct tingana is uh, one of the oldest males here in the game reserve and his body the build and the size is huge compared to these other uh, males that i have seen before in juma and something that gives me a confirmation on tingana is that the left ear has got a cut and i always mark that so I will show you that ear very nicely when we've got a better sighting again later on. You can see now Tingana decided to move and this direction of movement is towards now the eastern side which is where I am hoping we are going to have a better sighting. So I will follow him. I will be with Tingana for most of the times from now. So now I will be heading and try to find Tingana again. But now let's see, Steve, maybe he's got something interesting on his side. Let me see what Tingana is thinking, his intention and the mood. Well, indeed, it is the time of the day for the leopard to be moving. As I was talking about earlier, the animals will come down and drink before the night. The leopards will start moving as the light starts to change and the heat or the day itself becomes a bit cooler. And how interesting that Sydney and us, we crossed paths. If we'd only just crossed paths a little bit earlier, we might have been the lucky ones to bump into him. Very interesting. Well, well done, Sidders. Well, we've got the sun setting. Beautiful cloudy afternoon. Beautiful coloration in the dust. And once again, that moment in the day to reflect on your day, reflect on your weekend, if you will. Any unresolved issues? Any bad words with any friends or family? and hold on to them. It's only these moments that we have. We'll be grateful for them. Good company, hey Seb? Good company, sunsets. Cheers to that. Time to reflect on what's important in your life. Lots of things out there we put a lot of importance in that have absolutely no importance really, if you think about it. Are you healthy? Do you have loved ones around? That's all that really matters. Be grateful for that. All the money in the world can't buy that. Beautiful. Hmm. Deep, deep breaths. And just a, another moment of silence before we fly all the way back up north to the Masai Mara. Well, it sounds like a beautiful scene over there with Steve. We also have a beautiful scene over here, up in the Masai Mara. And as you can see, this lady is giving us a very intense stare. And she was snacking on a small bush in front of her before we arrived. Very, very good. We're just heading home on our way back from spending the day out with the Sausage Tree Pride. And for those, who have nev those of you who have never met me before, my name is Scott and I'm teamed up with James on camera. Like I said, we've been spending the day sitting with the Sausage Tree Pride of Lion, or at least two of them. Uh, Brent found them early this morning and we kind of took over from him in the hope that they would try and snipe some of the herds of wildebeest next to them. But they just slept the whole day and now it's time for us to head back. So I just thought I would stop and give you this beautiful view before we continue on. Wonderful. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have gathered that the migration has finally arrived. For those of you who haven't, well, there you go. It's good that you now know. 
and what I'd like to do now is just show you on a map and kind of give you an idea of where most of the herds are coming in on. So this is the border of Tanzania here that runs along the bottom. Most of the wildebeest that have come in on the western side of the river have come in around this area over here and they've slowly kind of pushed up all around the kind of salt lick into this area and the furthest herd I saw was right now up on kind of along this road. So they've made it kind of halfway up the length of the, the Mara Triangle and I can expect, well we can all expect a lot more to come. So that's some exciting news. There are of course others on the opposite side of the river where my hand is over here. Um, but that is not where we are exploring at the moment. So most of the herds in the kind of southwestern corner now and it really is wonderful to have them back in town. So very good. The first time I actually got to spend some time with them was after dark a couple of nights ago. I spent two nights out um, trying to find some uh, lions for Brent during the TV show the other day. But very, very exciting stuff and I look forward to spending some more time with you guys in the coming day. Sadly, we had some tech issues on this vehicle today, so we missed one another, but I'll be spending a lot of time out and hopefully you'll be able to jump on board with me. Very good. For now, we are going to send you back to Taylor McCurdy, who I'm guessing is also doing just the same as me, making her way home. A lioness. Someone told me that there was a male lion around here, so now I'm just making sure it's not one of the sub adults from the Olololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololololol
just shakes his head. I mean, now he's laughing. Must be a jackal. Baboons, says Archie. All baboons, I could be wrong, probably in the forest somewhere. I don't know. A baboon, it's a baboon. <laughs> <laughs> Archie wins. I don't know why I'm taking you on safari. I don't know what I'm talking about. I've, I'm not even a safari guide. You know, I just arrived today and they just let me be on the show. <laughs> that's awkward. I feel like that's not the worst thing I've done live though. It's because it's windy and I'm going deaf. Let me listen again. It's a new species I've just discovered, the baboon jackal. That's what I'm going to go with. See, even that lion at one point was looking. She was also confused whether it was a lion, I mean a baboon or a jackal. But Archie's right, it does sound, <laughs> the more and more I hear it, that does sound like a, uh, like one young baboon whining a little bit. Maybe it has spotted the lion from a great distance. Now, anyway, seeing as though most of the time I have no idea what's going on, let's go to Steve, who seems to be a bit more clued up. <laughs> I have got uh, Tingana with me at the moment. Tingana is heading towards the direction of the waterhole, where I'm going to keep following until Tingana drinks. Listen to that. Is that not nice? That is very interesting. I love that sound, Tingana sowing. I wish you could do that again, eh? So now I am going to pull forward and go around so that I can again have a better sighting of Tingana. So I'm just going to, to pull out now and see if we can reposition ourselves and see this beautiful Tingana. The leopards can live up to 12 to 15 years, so they can survive much longer. But the problem is when they start to lose as well, the tooth, it becomes very much difficult. You can see Tingana is also getting very old, but it's depending on food caught by Hosanna, which is very good because Tingana maybe also fed Hosanna quite a lot before. Now it's retaining all the favor that it has been done before. Now I, I've got a very uh, good visual on him coming towards that direction. I'm just gonna try and position myself nicely. He is slowly coming. And Nina Mu, I did not copy that question nicely. If FC, you can repeat that question for me. Thanks. Nina Mu, the lepers, they leave their territories when the new boss comes in, which is very much difficult to tell because it's not like an automatic decision. Someone else has to enter the territory and take over the territory and that is when a lot of them lose the titles of being the dominant males in these areas. So that is determined by the strength of the new owner and the time when the new owner arrived. So I can see now that he's walking around, marking the territory. I can even pick up that scent mark. It's quite very much strong. So 
So I am going to uh, follow him until I get to the water hole. Are you still okay there, Senzo? So now we are going to move and try to follow Tingana. Hmm. There was a diker just jumped right in front of me. Paula, that is true indeed. He is very much relaxed. I can see he is not worried about anything at the moment. So I'm just going to try by all means again and have a better position. He is very much relaxed, not in a hurry. He knows where he's going and there's no much competition here where he is. He has not done hunting for quite a lot of times now. He's just depending on Osana's food all the time. So now here, I... Asila, Tingana makes that so in order to advertise his presence in his territory. So that is a way of communicating with all the other lepers in the area that this is my place and I'm still responsible and I am very much dangerous. Look at that. This is beautiful. Look at that. Tingana is very beautiful. Earlier on, there was a question about how I see that this is Tingana. It's just that at this stage, it's quite difficult to show you. I will show you again soon, maybe when we get to the water hole, that the ears don't look the same. One ear has got a cut, and that is what is making me to identify Tingana amongst the other lepers here in the game reserve. So I can see now that Tingana is now going down uh, that area there. So I'm just gonna follow him and see. He's not far away, he's now getting there slowly. So now let's again keep following. I'm going to follow Tingana now. So now let's see, Steve is also out looking for something interesting. Let's see, maybe he got something. Well, always in search of something of interest and we decided why not pop down to the favorite watering hole of the hippos down here by Chitwa and there they are we thought maybe there'd be some more excitement happening in and around but uh, there's a quiet down here by the watering hole the hippos were making a noise a moment ago but it was just fantastic what James was able to see this morning. He got another wild, he got wild dogs down here. If you did not see this morning's show, ladies and gentlemen, you need to go back and watch it. It was unbelievable. Wild dogs chased an impala, jumped into the dam. It swam with a crocodile following it, and it was such a slow motion ending. It was really, really cool. If you didn't see it, it's very worthwhile going back and having a look and something that you do not often see in South Africa, and James has seen it twice in a matter of a few days. So very, very interesting indeed. I'm kind of hoping may maybe we would have bumped into some wild dogs down here. Oh, Seb, I'm just going to turn a little bit back. Seb, we've got a fish eagle 
drinking there. Our favourite little fish eagle. Here he is with his feet in the water. Often eagles will do that to cool themselves down. You often see martial eagles doing that, standing in the water, cooling themselves. But this fish eagle was actually having a drink a moment ago. There we go. A beautiful bird. You never know what you're going to see out on safari. Anything could happen. I think James was sitting here this morning watching the sunrise and talking about a gymnogene and then suddenly wild dogs were on the scene. So these things do just suddenly happen. There's no planning, there's no preemptiveness, there's no email sent out with a weekly schedule telling you what's going to be taking place. The animals just do their thing. That is what makes it awesome to be out in the wilderness. And that's why Safari Live is able to bring you some quite crazy things from time to time. You never know what might happen. Yes, the hippos are snorting. The bush is slowly starting to quieten down. I'm sure this fish eagle is going to finish his drink and go find a roost for the evening. Not long after that, the hippos will start emerging out of the water for their nightly foraging. MGN, you reckon it's a small tail on the fish eagle? Yeah, well, I don't know. Here we have another look, Seb. Quite a small tail. Yeah, it's pretty average, you know. I mean, Broad tails or long tails are normally sort of for for bush felt species that uh, or for forested species short wing, broad wings with sort of a broad long tail uh, are ideal for for dense woodland areas and then long tails for for very open areas in the case of the crowned eagle um, not the crowned eagle the the golden eagle, but the fish eagle spends most of his time in and around the water, so it doesn't do too much huge amounts of flying. Um, it does a lot of perch flying, so it'll sit on a perch and then it'll spot some prey in the water and then fly down. So I suppose it's got just the, the average sort of size tail that it would need for its flight. Um, but the pied coloration is characteristic of most of the fish eagles we see in the world. But I suppose you're right, there's no real elaborateness to the tail there. It looks quite interesting on the on the thermal camera as well, hey Seb. Nikita, you want to know how far the fish eagle's call carries? Well, it's a few kilometers at least, because we often hear them uh, from here when we're at our camp. But that also has a lot to do with the wind direction. And there we go, the guinea fowl that quite often if you have if we could go to the thermal camera uh, Lou that would be great you can see the coloration of the fish eagle with the um, oh terribly sorry folks the thermal picture is not coming through that side but the guinea fowls have got bright orange heads because that's where they give off a lot of their heat and their feet were also quite warm the fish eagle's feet are also quite warm, or the legs anyway, and that face area is quite warm. The rest is very well insulated, but they've all come in for a drink, and it's quite interesting because if that fish eagle was in the tree or in the sky, it would be a predator to those birds, but it knows that being on the ground or in the water like that, it's no threat. Marvellous how we see these interactions between the prey and the predator. Gary, I think birds birds of prey eat daily. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, I've got a strong feeling that they will eat daily. They'll eat as much as they need to. Um, so I, I would assume um, a fish eagle can spend 5-10 minutes a day catching food and it'll be su sufficient for the rest of the day. So very efficient hunters, they just need one fish and they are pretty much sorted for the rest of the day. Um, so it's not a very, very high appetite that they have. Um, in other parts they'll actually feed on much larger prey in the form of flamingos. They'll only feed on a, on a small amount of that before moving off. And um, yeah, so 
lots of food around all the watering points in most of the areas in southern Africa you'll always find fish eagles there but a very low sort of foraging rate they don't have to do too much they just hang around and they also can scavenge they any dead fish that might come around uh, they could also go for those guinea fowl if they were able to um, sneak up on one which they do from time to time the guinea fowl are giving the fish eagle a little bit of a wide berth basically saying I know who you are <laughs> stay right where you are <laughs> Hello Nancy, a wingspan of a fish eagle is about a meter, I'd, I'm going to assume right now. I don't have the figures on me though, but um, let me double check. I don't think this app actually gives a proper wingspan. Let me have a look though. I think it's about one, this is around a meter, so about a yard. And they're not the largest of eagles, they're definitely in the small sort of spectrum. Well, they're a, a medium sized eagle, not a, not a small raptor. Okay, let me have a look, see if it says anything here about wingspan. I mean, it says 68 centimeters, but that's its, that's its height. Two and a half kilograms, doesn't give me a wingspan here, I'm afraid. I'm gonna have to look that up for you. But a very common bird in the African continent, and the call is indicative of, the, of Africa that If you've never heard it before, I will play it for you. Beautiful, characteristic African sound. And quite territorial. You don't find too many breeding pairs too close to each other. They, they demarcate their territory through the calls and they quite often will also have certain battles in the air. The fish eagles are the masters of what we call t um, t spiral spiraling and they actually grab with their talons and they can spin in a circle and it's almost like a, a, a game of chicken. The first one to let go kind of concedes the airspace and then they kind of move off. So they know the call of each other, they know their oppositions and their rivals through their call and they demarcate the territory through that call and obviously food resource will determine how many fish eagles you can find in an area in very very fish abundant rivers you can have very very narrow territory ranges and in areas where the, the prey is a little less abundant well you only find one maybe two pairs in that area there he goes and out of shot <laughs> beautiful as I said, you never know what's going to happen. It could just disappear. Oh, MGN, I'd love to show you a Marshall Eagle. They are the largest and the most beautiful of the African Eagles. They um, really are something to behold. When we just look at the talons there of the fish eagle, you can see they're very strong feet. But the Marshall Eagle has got enormous feet, enormous claws, enormous talons on their feet, which are designed for breaking and severing spinal columns and vertebrae of certain animals um, whereas the fish eagle there has actually got a very interesting sort of non-slip pad on the bottom which enables them to hold on to the slipperiest of prey items and can quite often emerge out of the water with a fish just held on by two sort of talons with that non sort of slip grip underneath almost like deck shoes if you've ever done sailing before but it works much better very good case of evolution. Yes, Alan, well, I'm, I'm amazed this is your first one. They are very common. Uh, we do find them at most watering holes inside. Oh, here he goes. He's going for the heron. He's chasing a heron there. Now, the heron is also a fish eater, and he's said to the heron, this is my pond. Don't you come and steal my food. And that is interspecific competition right there of a fish eagle telling a bird that also feeds on fish that this is his patch. Um, and they are renowned for chasing away all sorts of other predators, 
uh, the Pell's fishing owl, which is the rarest of the owl species we find in South Africa. Um, on certain rivers in South Africa, we still find them, but many other places, they just get chased by fish eagles. Fish eagles actually outcompete them. Even though the owl is bigger, the Pell's fishing owl it is a, a very rare and endangered owl. Beautiful owl. I've only seen a handful of times, but the fish eagles are always competing against them because of the food resource. And there he is. He's surveying his territory and his landscape. And uh, I, think, I think Sydney has got his IR light sorted out. So we're going to be moving off from Chitwa watching all shortly. But let's go over to Sydney and see how the Duke is doing. I've just arrived now at Galagopan in order to see Tingana drinking. I can see that he is not very far at the moment. He is nice and close. He will be here at any time from now. Sounds like okay here. We, we we are now waiting for him to come. He might come here at any time. I've just seen him now approaching in between the bushes there, but I can't see him coming out. He's very much relaxed. He's not walking too fast. Rosalind, the leopardis can go up to 8 to 10 millimeters. Those are the canines, and those are the longest in their mouth. So those kind of tooth are very suitable to grab the animal from the neck. So they act like pins. Look at that. He's marking everywhere. can see he's taking his time. The bears are making noise. They are complaining against his presence and he doesn't mind them. <laughs> Bobby, that's quite a very nice comment. Yes, Tingana might be wondering if Hosanna already got something because Tingana is not killing anymore. So you can see now that Tingana is now trying to check something. So there's some other guests here in the area where we are. He's not far away from the pen, slowly coming. Look at that. Look at how he's walking, he's walking as if he's about to stalk something. He's trying to concentrate as well on what is happening here. He decided to lie down a bit. It has been a very long walk because from the beginning where we found him, he has been walking for a long distance now, approximately a kilometer and a half now. I'm not too sure where he started walking. Maybe he has been walking for more than that now. Look at that. I have not noticed Tingana limping today. Today Tingana is just walking normally. You can see also how he's arranging the legs as he's moving forward.
is trying to check something, is trying to sniff something. I'm not too sure what he's trying to investigate here. You know, the cats can be able to see things that we cannot see where we are because mostly Tingana and the other cats, they show me if there's any other animal in the area apart from them. Look at how lepers walk softly. I'm not hearing anything where I am. When he's stepping, he's so silent. I wish he can saw again. He's trying to investigate all these alarm calls. Maybe he thinks these alarm calls are coming. Our beard, Tingana is trying to investigate each and every alarm call here. Maybe he knows that when these other animals such as impalas are walking on the deckers, these ground dwellers, the birds, the francolins, they always complain. Look at that. You can see him right there. This is beautiful. So you can see that after eating something, they've got quite a lot of moisture and they don't really go and drink. I didn't copy the question from Nikita FC, if you can repeat that for me. Nikita, at this stage, when looking at the fitness of Tingana, I can see that Tingana still have got things not finally digested in the stomach. So I don't think Tingana will be going for hunting activities today. And he has not been hunting for quite a long time as he has been depending on Osana on several occasions as we saw on the past few weeks. You can see that if Osana was not around, Tingana was going to battle because of the injury. Imagine Tingana having that kind of an injury where he cannot be able to chase an animal and nobody is killing for him. I think the coming back of Hosanna gave Tingana quite a lot of benefits. Maurice, the lepers, they come and drink, they, they, that is determined by the moisture from the prey. If they don't have a lot of moisture from the prey, they must have to come and drink almost every day. You will see them coming in the morning and late afternoon. That is very much normal. But after having a meal with a lot of moisture, they get all the moisture from the meat. That is why after having a meal, the first droppings to come out, you will see them very dark black because of quite a lot of uh, blood. You can see he's very much thirsty, still drinking. Look at that. These animals don't drink without concentrating. <laughs> you can see they don't drink without checking what is happening. The eyes are still focusing. He's not looking at the water. You can see he's drinking, but he's looking above the water. can see that the Foktail Drongo is complaining about him drinking. Maybe Foktail Drongo also wants to drink there. You can see that the Foktail Drongo is singing this song to say, Tingana, you must go, I want to drink as well. But this is not the time for the Foktail Drongo to eat, obviously. It might be here coming for the last drink.
he gave up. So look at the ears now, how I identify. Tracy, the chances of another leopard around are very much high because this animal, this leopard, mostly we are seeing them meeting accidentally. But they can be able to detect the, 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 the sense as they are moving around. So they detect each other's presence as they are walking here. So if you look at the ear on the right, Senzo, just uh, sh uh, show that ear which is on the left. I just want to see how I distinguish between Tingana and the other lepers. The one that is just moved now. So that is the ear which confirms to me that this is Tingana. If you look at that ear, it has got a cut and the, the other ear is nice and round. So the ear on the left is the one which is showing me that this is Tingana. So I, I identify Tingana from the ears every time. So each one of them has got its own sports pattern. Look at that. You can see now he's just sitting like that. I'm sure that allows water to go down very nicely now. Look at that post. And this is phenomenal. If you can see this kind of cats, they are more active when the temperature is down. When temperature is cooling is when they are doing their activities. So I will be here again in order to read what he's trying to think. So let's see, Steve, let's see, maybe Steve has got some of the new updates about his operation there. No updates. Last minute leopard, I think, is what's on the card. So we're going to check to see if Osana has woken up and has maybe moved back into any of the familiar areas that we know him to be in. But it's quite interesting because I was listening to the radio earlier and uh, north of the property, pretty much where they found Tingana coming in, uh, the guys were talking about how a porcupine had been killed and dragged north into Bivosuk. So no doubt that was Tingana who did that. But I didn't think he would have already materialized back on Juma. How marvelous it is that we've managed to have him for the afternoon. Well done, Sydney. But a porcupine, that is no easy meal. I've once seen a lion kill a porcupine. Two lions, young males, came up to the porcupine. And the porcupine, it was that time of year when these little pans have got water in it. The porcupine ran up to the pan and put its head towards the little little bit of water and it was stumping its back feet and the quills were shaking and shaking like this and the first young lion that went towards the porcupine was very tent, very inexperienced it would seem and didn't do anything just looked very confused to do with the spiny thing and the second one came from the side just looked at him smashed him on his back pulled all the quills forward and then just bit him on the back on the neck and then we watched him eat it and as he was eating it, the quills were just falling out of his face. It was quite something. Uh, another six females materialized on the scene and he didn't share anything. So that porcupine didn't seem to injure him at all. But I think it's all about, just like if, if you ever do have to handle a snake or a monitor lizard or something, you've got to go in quickly and you've got to grab it with confidence. Otherwise, you're going to get hurt. So I think that's what he did. He just knew. He's probably done it before and it worked for him. Just went in, flattened it picked it up and he enjoyed it that very thick fatty layer on the back that holds all the quills that looked very tasty very very tasty indeed it was one of the first porcupines I'd seen in the wild and I was like oh hello everybody here's a porcupine and oh hang on there's a lion and look there's another lion and now we've got a lion with porcupine hanging out of its face <laughs> it was quite something to see it was. It was quite exciting, Lee. Okay, well, are we going to manage to get him? 
Mr. Q, I have never tasted a porcupine, but to to have the defense that it has and the spines and all of that, the quills on the back, must mean it tastes good, I'm going to assume. Otherwise, it would rather just go for some form of anal pasting or gland. For example, civets, they defend themselves through, through anal pastes and glands, just like honey badgers do, and things don't eat them. They go, Ugh, you're just gonna taste revolting. Porcupine is a rodent, it doesn't have any of those defense mechanisms, so it needs to defend itself and being quite a large rodent, it can't do what normal rodents do and go under the ground or up into a tree or whatever it might be. They are pretty much stuck to the ground and so to survive out here, and obviously it's worked for many of them, otherwise they never would have gotten as far as they have. But uh, you do see many a lion and leopard shying away from porcupines because um, it's just not an easy thing to catch those spines. But there is definitely a technique and with any predator, you'll notice that certain predators have really got the knack for it over others. Almost specializing in a certain prey animal. Last minute leopard for our side. Are we going to find the little chief? No doubt that now his father's been found. He's going to feel a little bit left out of the limelight this evening. Or maybe he's just taking a break. It's possible possible it's also possible that he's caught himself in Impala somewhere nearby where we had left him this morning he was definitely on a mission he was up and down wasn't he Seb yeah. if it wasn't for the technology of the drone it would have been impossible for Tristan to have kept up with him so Lou's saying Tingana does have quite a full belly and I'm wondering if that's just from a porcupine it's possible I mean porcupines are the largest rodent. I wouldn't say they're more than 20 kilograms at the biggest, but I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look that up. I've never ever thought about the weight of a porcupine. Have you, Seb? No? I would say it was around 15, yeah. 15 to 20, I would assume, at the most. I did try the meat in Gabon. It's very good. Seb said he's tried the meat before in Gabon. Uh, he said it's very tasty. Porcupine stew. But you didn't have to catch it yourself with your face, did you, Seb? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he didn't have to catch it himself. Okay, well, fantastic, folks, from myself and Seb. It's likely a good night from us. We're going to go back up to Sydney with the Duke of Juma. Have a good night. have a sleep he's just lying down now because maybe he had quite a lot of water i am not alone here at the set sighting at the moment i do have some of the guests coming from the other areas so don't get surprised when seeing the spotlights shining on this leopard so you can see that the leopard is looking very much relaxed So this is what they do after a meal and after quite a lot of water. They must have to rest a little bit so that the body can absorb whatever has been eaten or something that he was drinking. You can see the eyes are even closed now. Nikita. Lepers, they are indeed very opportunistic hunters. They just eat anything that is coming. When he's hunting for a taker, a scrub bear comes, he will catch it. When Impala comes, he will catch that. So they are very much opportunistic. He heard something, not sure what exit it was, but I could see that how he lifted up the head, there is something that he picked it up. Look at that eye. These animals can see, they can see a lot more than we do. It's very much easy to bump into a sighting of the cats because of this behavior of sleeping long hours. You can easily bump right onto the cats lying down, not even seeing them. 
Sometimes animals, when they're surprised, can also tend to be very dangerous. They are potentially dangerous. Not too sure if uh, Tingana is going to sleep around here tonight. It has been very great this afternoon having all the lovely sightings all the way from Mara down to South Africa Juma Game Reserve. It was never easy for me this evening to find any of the cats, but I was lucky enough just before the end to come across Tingana and the elephants and all the other interesting things my other colleagues has been sharing with you since the beginning. Thank you very, very much for all your questions and your comments. Let's meet again tomorrow at half past six.